Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live. I'm Lindsay Davis. We begin with breaking news, a landmark decision involving former President Donald Trump. The Colorado Supreme Court has ruled Trump is ineligible to run for president in 2024 under the 14th Amendment. The court is citing the so-called insurrection clause in the Constitution because of the role they believe Trump played on January 6th. Colorado's Secretary of State is now ordered to exclude Trump's name from the state's Republican presidential primary ballot. The historic decision now sets up a major battle before the nation's highest court. Leading us off tonight, ABC News political director Rick Klein and ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley. Rick, let's start with you. What exactly are the documents outlining as the rationale for not allowing former President Trump on the ballot? Well, the 14th Amendment, if you read it, makes pretty clear that if you engage in insurrection, you're ineligible to hold a, a public office. And in fact, the lower court in Colorado said that they found that President Trump did engage in an insurrection, but then they, they relied on kind of a, a narrow, almost technicality to say, we don't believe that, that this is an officer of the United States. The, the Colorado Supreme Court is actually overturning that and saying that the court was right in finding that the, the president engaged in an insurrection, tried to overturn the election, but was wrong in saying that that didn't disqualify him from office. And they are saying that, yes, this disqualifies him. But of course, it's a tenuous ruling. We know that other states and judges in other places have, have disagreed with it. And the, the Trump campaign is saying they will immediately go to the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and we're even seeing the, the, this court say that they don't want to see this enacted until it has a chance to be appealed. They recognize the gravity of this decision. And the Trump campaign released a statement calling it a flawed decision and promising to appeal. Do you feel in some ways that this is just playing right into Trump's hands, that his claims that the election is rigged against him? Yeah, honestly, Lindsay, I think this is something that the Trump campaign uh, feels good about because they can lean in on it. He, look, his opponents, none of his major opponents, even Chris Christie, think that the 14th Amendment should apply here. They're saying that the voters should have the opportunity to weigh in. And this does dovetail almost almost too, too well for comfort for those rivals with the, the claim that President Trump continues to make that not just that the election was stolen, that false claim, but also that there's an effort to try to deny him and his movement uh, another chance to regain the presidency. I can't imagine that the, 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 the former president is going to lean in it, on it and his remarks in Iowa this evening and continue to campaign on moves like this by Democratic uh, 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 judges that, uh, that, in his view, disenfranchises his own voters. And, and politically, what does this do when we're talking about other states who have similar attempts uh, trying to keep Trump off of their ballots? Well, we know that in, in six other states, we've seen judges reject these arguments. So it is, of course, uh, a, a very split decision, to say the least, to have now one court in Colorado, the Supreme Court in Colorado, have this opinion. Uh, it is going to almost certainly have to go to the United States Supreme Court to, to, to sort out. Uh, it might give cover to other, other efforts to, to, try to, to try to deny ballot access. But I think now there's going to be a realization that only the Supreme Court is going to be able to sort this out. We have national elections in this country. We also have elections, though, that are administered by the the state, which is what gives the Colorado Supreme Court uh, the ability uh, and, in fact, the, the necessity to rule on a challenge like this. And, and President Biden did win Colorado in 2020 with 55 percent of the vote. So how big could the impact be if this really is allowed to stand? Is this state really seen to be as in play for Republicans in 2024? I, yeah, I think the least of the concerns are Colorado and its 10 electoral votes, not just because Colorado isn't really a frontline battleground like it used to be just a few election cycles ago. It has drifted to the left, but also because it is likely that there's going to be a national standard set on this. And if the U.S. Supreme Court rules on it, it's going to make that clear everywhere. In the meantime, though, we'll have a bit of a hodgepodge in a waiting, in a waiting period. All right, Rick, thank you so much. And for more on this, I want to bring in ABC News legal contributor and professor of law at University of Baltimore, Kim Whaley. Kim, thanks so much for joining us. What's next for the former president here? The Colorado Supreme Court ruling against him. They're promising to appeal. Now what? Well, it would go to the Supreme Court of the United States, which now al already is considering Donald Trump's claim of complete absolute presidential immunity for January 6th. And there's also a related case um, that could affect two of the counts uh, pending against him in D.C. relating to the January 6th insurrection. Also, the Supreme Court just took that. So that's that's a lot on the plate of the Supreme Court. And there's, of course, a lot of pressure um, across the board because the caucuses are coming up, the, you know, uh, Super Tuesday, and of course the election is less than a year away in November of next year. And your, to your point there, if this does go all the way up to the Supreme Court, could the justices take this case up that quickly and decide before the Iowa caucus and New Hampshire primaries, which are about to get underway? Well, we saw the court do this in, you know, 
2020 with the election uh, and all the cases relating to the, the false claims of election fraud, but also um, ballot counting, mail-in ballots, things like that. The court can do things rapidly if it decides. Uh, and so I think there's there's also going to be all eyes on the court and how, uh, with these are split decisions, if they're thinking about this politically, there are doctrines that they can employ to step out of it and just not get involved, or they can get involved. But the thing to keep in mind is, even if the court sets a standard on what the definition is of an insurrection and whether the president is an officer, that wouldn't necessarily affect all of the states because um, each state has different laws for how you get on the ballot. And so even a Supreme Court ruling isn't necessarily going to impact everyone because you need a, a, you know, a hook to get into court to begin with that doesn't have a lot to do with, uh, with the 14th Amendment. Here it has to do with who gets to be on the ballot under Colorado law. And what happens if the Supreme Court declines to take the case? Well, then the Colorado Supreme Court's decision, the one that came down day, today, that stands. And Donald Trump is not on the ballot in the state of Colorado uh, for the 2024 presidential election. And what do you think about the state's decision? We were just talking to Rick. Obviously, other states have considered this, but then weighed in, in the other direction. Uh, your thoughts uh, on what, how Colorado is ruling here? Well, honestly, I mean, I, I see the political argument, but the, but the Constitution is the Constitution, and the reason it's in there, it's a post-Civil War amendment to keep Confederates out of the reconstructed government. So the Constitution's the top dog in the, in the country. You can't be 25 and one for president. So, I mean, that, that sort of, that supersedes voters, really. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the Supreme Court makes the argument, the Colorado Supreme Court, uh, that the president is treated as an officer 25 other times in the Constitution. Constitution, so I don't think it's an invalid ruling. Is there any precedent for a case like this that we can look to for guidance? Not from the Supreme Court, no. I mean, there are just a handful right after the Civil War, but it's really sort of gone by the wayside because we've never been in a position uh, where someone running for president engaged in an insurrection. Uh, and both courts now have found that, the lower court and the, and the Supreme Court. If you were a betting woman, do you think the Supreme Court takes up this case? And let's go even further, how do they rule? Well, I think, you know, given that it's percolating in multiple states, the Supreme Court might wait to see what's happening in other places. Um, you know, I think if, if they do take it up, it would be a split decision. I think there's no way it would be um, sort of a unanimous ruling. I'm sure the conservatives would find a technical reading of this idea of officers. But the Colorado Supreme Court applied dictionary definitions from, you know, 1787. Uh, so it's kind of a conservative approach. Um, but it's so political, Lindsay. It's, it's just kind of a stunning from a constitutional law perspective that we're in this moment in American history right now. It really is fascinating indeed. Kim Whaley, we thank you so much for your insight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Turning now to the other big story of the night, the devastating aftermath from that powerful storm that ransacked parts of the Northeast. Tonight, the death toll is on the rise with a new storm taking shape set to impact millions of Americans ahead of the busy holiday travel weekend. Dangerous flooding prompting emergencies in New Hampshire. Many roads looking more like rivers. The Pemi River expected to rise and overflow overnight. Lewiston, Maine issuing evacuation orders today. Two people in that state missing tonight after their cars swept away in rushing water. And in Lincoln Park, New Jersey, a home on fire surrounded by water. Firefighters seen trying to battle those flames. Tonight, a new round of lake effect snow is headed this way. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano will time that out for us. But first, ABC's Trevor Alt and that destructive storm. Tonight, rivers raging and rising out of their banks across the Northeast, flooding new neighborhoods after a powerful storm slammed the region. First responders going door to door in Little Falls late today, evacuating trapped families, using boats to take residents to higher ground in Wayne. In Lincoln Park, a home surrounded by four feet of flood water engulfed in flames. This fire has been burning basically unchecked now for at least 45 minutes. Firefighters in high water vehicles barely able to get close enough to reach the fire and not far away in Patterson. First responders seen carrying a person from a flooded home on a stretcher. Uh, this was apparently a dialysis patient that needed some medical attention. The house was surrounded by floodwaters. South of Boston in situate Massachusetts, a race to restore power. Right now getting the schools back on is a top priority as well as our water treatment plant is still on generator power. 
Residents filling gas cans for their generators. Cafe owner Mary Ellen Stoddard throwing away spoiled food. This is a tough week for this to happen. It's tough anytime it happens, but Christmas week is, is brutal. And it's not over. Authorities in Lewiston, Maine, ordering evacuations there late today. In the town of Mexico, authorities still searching for two people after their car was swept away Monday. Maine's governor declaring a state of emergency for 14 counties. The death toll from the storms rising to at least five across multiple states. Deadly and destructive. Trevor all joins us now. Trevor, you're in New Jersey where there's still a flood threat tonight. Uh, there sure is, Lindsay, and for context, behind me are the Great Falls with the Passaic River rushing over it. Now, typically, you'd be able to see a number of rocks, large stones, boulders at the bottom. You can't see them right now because they're all underwater, and this river is not expected to crest until late tonight. This whole area is going to be under major flood stage through tomorrow. Lindsay. All right, Trevor Alt for us. Thank you. And with major rivers still rising in the northeast, a powerful storm is targeting the west with heavy rain, wind, and massive disruptions as holiday travel ramps up. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us tonight. Hey, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. You're right about that. The, the Passaic's not the only river here in the Northeast that's still in flood stage. We've got dozens of them that are overflowing their banks at this hour. And most of these in, in red highlighted, they're going to be cresting here in the next day or two and then receding uh, slowly. We're looking for a couple days of dry weather at least. Meanwhile, flood watches are up in the west because of this big storm hitting Northern California now. And it's going to slide into uh, uh, Southern Cal Central and Southern California in the next couple days. Could see wind gusts to 60 miles an hour. It's going to take its time. So some of these numbers are going to really begin to pile up. Thursday by the way, the busiest air travel day of the year. So Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, you could have some issues with air travel delays. Three to five inches of rainfall expected from Orange County up through uh, Santa Barbara, San Lu uh, Luis Obispo. Four to eight maybe in the Santa, uh, Santa Monica Mountains and up towards Ventura. And because of that, in those hilly areas, there's a high potential of seeing uh, uh, rock and mudslide activity right through uh, Friday uh, Friday morning. So that could be a big high impact storm for the West Coast. We just got done with ours here on the East Coast. Luckily uh, for the folks in the Northeast in the flood zone, we are looking for dry weather into the weekend. Lindsay? Oh, well, that is some good news there. Rob Marciano for us. Thanks so much, Rob. Now to the border battle in Texas. Tonight, the ACLU has filed a lawsuit challenging the state's new law that gives police sweeping new powers to arrest migrants who cross the border illegally. Here's ABC's Maria Villarreal with the latest. Tonight, with a record high number of migrants funneling through the southern border, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signing a new law allowing migrants suspected of crossing Super illegally to be arrested and Texas. ordered deported by the state. Biden's deliberate inaction has left Texas to fend for itself. Under the law, once in custody, migrants could be deported or prosecuted, facing up to six months in jail or 20 years in prison for repeat offenses. The goal of Senate Bill 4 is to stop the tidal wave of illegal entry into Texas. The Texas law immediately challenged as unconstitutional by the ACLU, saying it encourages racial profiling, can lead to family separations, and can deny migrants the chance to request asylum. This is an extreme law that will not and does not uh, make the communities in Texas safer. It just doesn't. There is an undeniable crisis at the border. Sources telling ABC News Customs and Border Protection encountered more than 12,600 migrants Monday, a daily record high, apprehending 11,000 outside legal ports of entry, the highest daily total in more than two decades. Nothing, nothing. The strain on U.S. resources, unprecedented. CBP closing rail crossings in El Paso and Eagle Pass, shifting personnel to counter the surge. We're we're facing severe challenges right now. Lindsay, these laws could go into effect as early as March, but critics say that it is the federal government's job, not the state, to police the border. As of right now, Abbott is saying that he will take this all the way to the Supreme Court, though, if he has to. Lindsay? Maria, thank you. The Texas Civil Rights Project is part of that lawsuit challenging the new border law. And joining us now, Aaron Thorne, the senior staff attorney for the Beyond Borders program at the Texas Civil Rights Project. Aaron, thanks for joining us. Let's start with the lawsuit. Why the decision to sue? 
Yeah, the decision to sue here was pretty easy and clear. Uh, Texas has threatened for a while to uh, pass a law like this, um, going way outside of their constitutional and legal authority um, to give state officials powers that they clearly don't have um, and to put a, a target on the back of immigrant communities, both at the border and throughout the state of Texas. So given that, uh, the decision to sue here was, was pretty clear. How is this new measure going to affect communities there? So this bill, uh, despite the fact that uh, proponents of the bill have, um, you know, said that that this would affect the borderlands uh, within 50 miles of the borderlands, which uh, millions of Texas Texans call home, uh, this law can be applied throughout the state of Texas, uh, regardless of where you are. Um, and so, you know, communities, immigrant communities, very far from the border, are right to to fear uh, criminalization under this law. We just heard the numbers, a record number of migrants illegally crossing the border yesterday, more than 12,000. What do you propose as a solution? Yeah, I propose that, you know, we have spent, uh, the, the, both the federal government and the state government of Texas have, have spent billions of dollars over the last 30 years trying uh, solutions to these deeply complex humanitarian problems. They spent that money solely in solutions that are based in criminalization and in trying to deter people by being as cruel as possible. And you can see by those numbers that it does not deter people because what we have here at its heart is a humanitarian crisis and you know I would propose starting with understanding that and investing in humanitarian solutions and lastly if Governor Greg Abbott is listening tonight what would you want to say directly to him yeah, I would, you know, like to say what, you know, at least one Republican in the Texas State uh, Senate said very clearly, um, the face of this law, we know, um, we've known for decades that giving state officials this type of power is clearly unconstitutional, and it will only result in more um, cruelty at the border and will not stop folks from coming because, as I said, this is a deeply complex solution. And I would encourage the governor to look beyond uh, the simple, blunt instruments of criminalization and, and look deeper at this problem and how, how Texas can, can, be solution, can make solutions and, and make Texas a more welcoming place for migrants. Aaron Thorne, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Tonight, we're seeing new video that captures the moment a powerful explosion ripped through a home in South Florida. The family inside was injured but miraculously survived. ABC's Victor Akendo is on the scene. Tonight, authorities are investigating what caused a massive gas explosion that leveled this home south of Fort Lauderdale. The house is completely gone. Doorbell cameras capturing a blast so powerful it blew a nearby door right off its hinges and sent a giant fireball into the night sky. Witnesses say it sounded like a bomb. A big bang, like, a, like as if a car ran into the house. That home, now a pile of rubble. The four people inside, including two children, made it out alive with broken bones and burns, some with life-threatening injuries. I hear the loud noise. A big boom? Big boom. 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 Shaking all the, the, the house, all the windows, all the doors. Officials suspect the explosion was caused by propane, but they're still investigating. The home was completely destroyed. It appeared to be by uh, some type of gas. Just yesterday, a propane explosion killed one woman at this hotel in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And last week, another person was injured in a home explosion nearby that officials suspect was also caused by a propane gas leak. So scary. Our thanks to Victor for that. Fallout from the Israel-Hamas war is growing as Iranian-backed militants step up attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea. In return, the U.S. has launched an international naval task force to protect that vital shipping lane. ABC's Britt Clenet is in Israel tonight. Tonight, Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen launching two more attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea, just as the U.S. announced a naval task force to counter the threat. 
The US joining nine countries to escort vessels passing through the crucial trade route after major companies, including oil giant BP, paused operations. Bottom line is, these attacks have to stop. They need to stop. They're unacceptable. Uh, the United States, our allies and our partners will do what we have to do to counter these threats and to protect these ships. But the Houthis vowing further attacks in retaliation for Israel's war in Gaza. Britt Clinton joins us now from Israel. Britt, we know that there was a new hostage video just released. What are you learning about that? That's right, Lindsay. Another hostage video released tonight. Images showing Gadi Moses and Ilad Katsir, who were kidnapped on October 7th. And also tonight, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he met with hostage families, saying their release is his highest mission. Meanwhile, the situation in Gaza growing more dire by the day. The death toll could hit 20,000 tomorrow or certainly in the next couple of days. It's expected to. Lindsay. All right. Britt Clannett reporting once again from Tel Aviv for us. Thanks so much, Britt. Officials in Iceland are monitoring a volcano as it continues to erupt. Last month, authorities evacuated nearly 4,000 residents, but as of now, the lava is flowing away from the only nearby town. Today, the government released a statement saying the eruption does not present a threat to life and that there are no disruptions to flights to and from Iceland. International flight corridors remain open. Still ahead here on Prime tonight, the new document set to be released in connection with disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein. But next in our Prime Focus, the fight for clean water. As millions of people around the world struggle to get access, we speak to the water warriors shining a light on just how dire the situation really is. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tonight, as extreme weather ravages parts of the world, from the flooded waters of Australia to the torrential rains and dangerous winds hitting New York, we want to shine a light on the silent crisis that's happening around the globe, the lack of access to clean drinking water. One in four people worldwide carry this burden, and unless you personally don't have access to tap water, it's something you probably don't spend much time thinking about. In tonight's Prime Focus, we travel to Mexico to meet some water warriors fighting for clean water everywhere. It is quite literally an uphill battle, a perilous pilgrimage. High in the hills of Mexico, in the heart of the San Juan Clacotenco forest, the worth of water is revealed. 
More than two billion people around the world shoulder this burden, this desperation born out of life without access to clean drinking water, prompting some to take these treacherous treks of survival. Es una familia muy humilde y la verdad pues ellos se mantienen de este pozo. This man carries out the age-old tradition with success. He's fortunate that upon his arrival, roughly an hour after sunrise, no one else has beaten him to the spring. The water has not run out. After filling his water bottles, he then begins the long journey home, this time hauling heavy jugs in tow. In some of the world's most remote places, water is a challenge at best. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City to really witness firsthand the impact of the water crisis. We wind our way around the Mexican mountainside, about 60 miles south of Mexico City, though it feels like a world away. This is the way to the spring, to the Sacasonapa Spring. And this spring has been around for... Hundreds of years. And this is the closest spring to the community. Tracing the steps of this life-threatening tradition in pursuit of a precious lifeline. It is right over here. But this is the travel yeah, that a person needs to do. Yeah, how do you do this do. if you have a lot exactly. of water? Exactly, carrying a jug of water, doing this. It is particularly hard. Yeah, I can only imagine. It's hard enough without any water. Right. And this is the spring. The steep climb concludes here. This has been a tradition for many of the villagers here for generations where they make this trek, sometimes several times a week, in order to get access to clean water from this sacred spring right here. And this water comes directly from the forest. Often women bear this burden, and it's one many are unaware of. Around the globe, women spend 200 million hours a day collecting water for their families. Eva Flores endures the hardship personally and professionally. Her restaurant, Los Aguandos, is one of the only restaurants here in San Juan Clacotenco. Oh, también aquí. She tells us she worries about water every single day. ¿Tú tienes suficiente? No. No, 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 no nos alcanza. No, nunca compramos por pipa aquí el agua. There is never enough. She primarily relies on the rainwater she harvests during the rainy season to run both her household as well as her business. Tú estás muy preocupada cada día para agua? Claro que sí. Sí, sí, porque le digo aquí nos hace pues lo primero, lo primero el agua. Pues aquí no 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 tenemos agua potable. But by the end of the dry season, when the water runs low, only further aggravated by extreme droughts linked to climate change, Ava, like so many here, needs to pay for water to be trucked up the mountain. We've seen certain communities where people spend as much as 20% of their income on water, which is insane. The giant tank right in Ava's front yard was installed by Isla Urbana, a local water NGO specializing in improving rainwater harvesting. Gets channeled in Most of the places that have very severe water access problems in Mexico are also very remote, rural, mm -hmm. predominantly very indigenous communities. This tank acts as a storage vessel to capture rainwater. It's connected to a filtration system, making it more manageable to do basic domestic necessities. And when it runs out, it can be filled back up by a water truck. When you have water crises like this, everybody always thinks of like access, no, like not having enough water. But the, the quality problem is just as big. Enrique Lomans founded Isla Urbana when he saw the water issues plaguing his hometown of Mexico City. It's one of the largest cities in the world, and it's running out of water. The, the street level is dropping about a foot and a half per year because of how quickly we're drawing water out of the ground. So yeah, 22 million people running out of water. Uh, it's like a pretty terrifying thought. A terrifying thought so many are facing. And Isla Urbana is just one of many organizations worldwide building solutions to help create equal access to water for all.
Hey, hey, how you doing? So nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. And so is one of Hollywood's biggest yeah, right. superstars. Matt Damon has taken on perhaps his most significant role yet. What made you decide, you know, I want to use my platform for good specifically in this way? As I started to learn about issues of extreme poverty, I was just shocked at how water really undergirded everything. I recently sat down with Damon and his co-founder Gary White in New York. They've pledged to help as many communities globally gain access to clean water. Together in 2009, they created Water.org. This is the global water crisis. The organization has already empowered more than 52 million people with access to safe water or sanitation through affordable financing in 11 countries and four continents. One after another, these women, among the most vulnerable on the planet, are really taking charge of their own solutions. And that's what's exciting for us, is it's not our story at all, it's their story. The reaction for kids, for girls and women who have been spending the majority of their days, you know, just in search of water, and now all of a sudden they have water. It's sheer liberation, right? You're, you're unshackled from this really uh, onerous existence. Your day is dominated by how am I going to find and collect water versus the ability to go to school and to start to think about, okay, well, what kind of life could I actually build for myself? It's a complete game changer. Each small loan they dole out literally transforms lives. One woman we met in the Philippines, she was paying about $60 a month in this slum for these water vendors. She took out one of these loans. Now she's paying $5 a month for the loan repayment and $5 a month for her utility bill. And there's been $4.2 billion in these micro loans. It's not just the, the needless kind of death and disease that happens because of this issue. It's, it's like, it's, it's the robbing human beings, particularly mm -hmm. girls, of their potential to, like, to, live, to live out their dreams and, be, and, and kind of, you know, maximize their potential and live the lives that they want to live. Rosalba. Hola, buenos días. Yo estoy Bienvenida a la casa, mucho gusto. Oh, igualmente. Dreams that Rosalva hopes will come true for her 14-year-old daughter Dulce. Hubo un tiempo donde ha pasado de que no hay agua y por ciertas cosas te enferma. Dulce, which means sweet, knows the bitter reality of life without regular access to water. It's a luxury here in the rural hills of San Juan Clacotenco. Dulce says she dreams of a day she doesn't have to worry about water or wait for the rain to come. Tenemos que esperar a que a veces la lluvia, o sea, que llueva para tener agua. Entonces lo que me gustaría es de que eso no pasara, que tuviéramos agua sin, digamos, sin restricción, sin tener que estar comprando. Rosalva explains to us that it's been raining less and less here and that she's forced to buy her own water. Several NGOs, including Sorar, help families like theirs get access to water and something that many take for granted, a place to go to the bathroom. Antes de este baño, yo tenía una, aquí llamamos una fosa, que es un hoyo adent, uh, dentro de la tierra. ¿Puedes mostrarme Claro que sí, adelante. Okay. She tells us she's had the bathroom less than a year. Globally, women spend 266 million hours a day finding a place to relieve themselves. Como puedes ver, aquí no utilizamos ni una gota de agua. Sarar helped Rosalva build her own bathroom on her property, as well as a filter system to make her rainwater instantly drinkable. Rosalva says both have tremendously improved her quality of life. Ya nosotros como que vivimos más sanamente, estamos más contentos, todo es mucho más limpio. Mm. And she's grateful, in large part, to Rafael Almasan. So we are about to engage the rainwater harvesting system. Yeah, we can hear the rain. Yeah. Coming. The director, Sarar, which helps women like Rosalva transform their relationship with water and sanitation. Rafael explains why the burden of water collection so often falls squarely on the shoulders of women. In the case of San Juan, for example, Rosalva has to go out to work every day, from 6 in the morning to 4 or 5 in the afternoon vendiendo sus nopales o trabajando en la tienda. Y después de eso todavía tiene que encargarse de las labores domésticas. Mm. Y una de esas labores domésticas es, pues, buscar agua. ¿Por qué es las mujeres que tienen que buscar el agua? ¿Dónde están los hombres? Los hombres, muchos de ellos migran a los Estados Unidos. Y, oh. Ajá. So, las mujeres están solas 
con los niños. Mm -hmm. mm. Sí. Leaving young girls like Dulce to bear this daily silent burden. She's already a water warrior, determined to help access and sustain this dwindling resource. Y eso es lo que me gustaría futuro, ayudar aquí en mi comunidad a eso, a que digamos haya agua en todas partes. Giving further credence to the old adage that when someone's thirsty, a drop of water is worth more than a sack of gold. A reality Dulce and her mom live every day as they treasure this simple yet sacred necessity that sustains us all. In some cases, the youngest among us trying to solve this crisis for the future. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, Google forced to pay hundreds of millions of dollars. Why the tech giant is forking over the money and how to know if you're eligible to cash in. But next, the Mariah Carey holiday song leading the Billboard's top 100 and how the Christmas classic is making history by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Make my wish
I was going to try and hit that high note, but I'll spare you all. That is Mariah Carey's hit song, All I Want for Christmas Is You. The holiday classic is back in the number one spot on Billboard's Hot 100 list. So as Americans everywhere crank up the holiday tunes this time of year, we take a look at the chart topper by the numbers. 13 straight weeks, that's how long Carrie's Christmas jingle has topped Billboard's list. And it's a record fifth straight holiday season. The song has reached the number one spot. The tune was originally released back in 1994, but it actually didn't make it into Billboard's top 10 until 2017, 23 years later. In 2019, the song took the number one spot for the very first time and has been hanging on ever since. The singer once said when she wrote it, she had no idea the impact it would eventually have worldwide. In 2021 alone, Billboard estimated the song generated about $6.1 million in master recording and publishing revenue based on 94,000 downloads and 823 million streams. Billboard estimates that Carrie likely pocketed about $1.5 million that year from the master recording profit and is one of the song's two writers. Her share of the publishing revenue would have been about $830,000 if it was split in half. Millions more went to her label, Sony Music. And in case you're wondering what song was knocked out of the number one spot before Mariah's song took over, that would be Brenda Lee's Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. Shocking new details about a body found at a Kentucky lake more than 20 years ago. Plus, the officer who shot an 11-year-old boy in Mississippi is speaking out. What he said when asked about the judgment he used during that incident. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. New documents set to be unsealed in connection with disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein. A body found in a lake identified as a fugitive wanted by the FBI. And tech giant Google forced to pay hundreds of millions of dollars. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. A federal judge has ordered a vast unsealing of court documents that will publicly reveal the names of many of convicted sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein's associates. The documents are part of a settled civil lawsuit that alleged Ghislaine Maxwell facilitated the sexual abuse of Virginia Gouffre. Anyone who did not successfully fight to keep their name out of the civil case may be revealed, including victims, co-conspirators, and innocent associates. The release has been set for New Year's Day, giving anyone who doesn't want their documents revealed time to object. The body found in a Kentucky lake more than two decades ago has been identified as an FBI fugitive. Kentucky State Police say they identified the body of Roger Parham with advanced DNA testing. Parham went on the lam from officials in Arkansas after he was arrested and charged with rape in 1998. The body, now identified as Parham, was found in May of 99. Police are now investigating how Parham's body may have ended up at the lake. A Tennessee clinic has found a case of lead poisoning connected to recalled apple puree. That reported by our ABC News affiliate in Nashville. The clinic says one patient had high levels of lead after allegedly eating a Wanabana apple cinnamon fruit puree pouch. The pouches were voluntarily recalled in October. An ongoing FDA investigation found that cinnamon at the facility where the pouches are made had extremely high levels of lead. The CDC said more than 200 cases across 33 states have been linked to the recalled purees. Google has agreed to pay about $700 million to make changes to settle allegations that it's been stifling competition against the Android Play Store. Details of the deal struck back in September with state attorneys general come out just after Google lost at a trial over the same issues. Google will let users of its Android mobile devices bypass the Play Store and directly download apps. Most of the settlement money will go directly to more than 100 million consumers across the country, with a small portion going to a fund for states to disperse to consumers with similar claims. A group that represents major tech companies is suing Utah over its new laws that say how and when children and teens can use certain computer apps. Utah is signing these strict new rules this year, which dictate how minors can use social media, including requiring a parent's approval and age verification, as well as limiting what times children and teens can use those platforms. NetChoice is a group representing companies that include TikTok, Meta, and X. It's filed a federal suit to stop those first-in-the-nation laws, saying they violated constitutional rights. Those laws set to take effect in March. They've released five gray wolves on Colorado land, marking the official start to reintroduce the wolves to that state. That historic release took place in Grand County after residents voted in favor of a ballot measure to bring back the endangered species to Colorado. Animal Control brought those wolves from Oregon, vaccinated, and then fitted the animals with GPS tracking before their release. Colorado officials want to reintroduce at least 10 to 15 wolves in the state by March, 30 to 50 wolves over the next three to five years. It's a case that raised a number of questions. An unarmed 11-year-old boy shot by a police officer in Mississippi. A judge is now sealing the release of police body camera video that recorded the moment back in May. A decision that comes a day after a grand jury decided not to indict Sergeant Greg Capers following a state investigation that found Capers did not engage in criminal conduct in the shooting of a Darian Murray. Officer Capers agreed to sit down with GMA3 anchor DeMarco Morgan exclusively to discuss the incident. It was a situation that I didn't expect to be in. 
just had no idea that it would turn out that way. It was in the wee hours of May 20th in Indianola, Mississippi, when Adarian's mother, Nikayla Murray, says her ex-boyfriend and father to one of her children knocked on her window and demanded to be let inside. 11-year-old Adarian says he was awakened by the commotion and told by his mom to call his grandmother and 911. But according to Nikayla, when two officers arrived, they knocked on the door, then tried kicking it down before Nikayla let them in. Once inside, Nikayla says she told the officers no one was armed. She says they told everyone to come out with their hands up. That's when 11-year-old Adarian, following the officer's commands, says he came out of his bedroom with nothing in his hands and was shot in the chest. For those who say having a badge comes with a ton of responsibility and they believe you acted poorly that day. Unless they're in our shoes, you just never know what you may run into. Spare the moment. It's a split decision that has to be made. Have you thought about that little boy since that day? All the time. All the time. The aftermath of that decision was tragic. Adarian suffered multiple injuries, including a collapsed lung and a lacerated liver. I talked to Adarian less than two weeks after the incident. I came out doing this. So I ran across the corner, and then I just got shot. And then I ran to, to my mom. And then so I was bleeding from, from my mouth. Then my mama, she was applying pressure to my chest. Adarian said he came out, raised his hands. He recognized you. Did you know this little boy leading up to the situation, or had you ever met him? I met him before. I met him before. Um, there's two sides to every coin, two sides to every situation. And of course, they're saying that, but I can tell you that's just not the way it happened. No justice, no peace. Officer Capers was suspended without pay and remains under administrative non-paid leave. And just days ago, a Mississippi grand jury determined he won't face any criminal charges. Adarian's mom says she's fighting to prevent Sergeant Capers from returning to active duty. I asked him several times to describe what he believes happened the day of the shooting, but he declined to answer on advice from his attorney citing pending lawsuits. So you think you did nothing wrong? I hate it that it happened. Definitely wasn't intentional. I hate that it happened. I've shed many tears, done everything I can to get this situation off of me. Adarian's mom has filed a $5 million federal lawsuit against Capers and the city of Indianola for her son's injuries and for what she says was a failing to properly train Capers. Can you talk about your training? Real good training, same training as Law enforcement in California, Georgia, wherever, is certified training. I'm a certified law enforcement officer. I took pride in what I did. I was good at what I did. I'm a public servant at heart. I always will be, regardless of how this turned out with in the Nola Police Department. Murray family attorney Carlos Moore says Sergeant Caper's actions were a clear use of excessive force. But you do understand the outrage. Absolutely. That comes with this situation. This Absolutely. Incident. I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone for the way that they feel. I have no issue with that. Because if it was me in that predicament, I'd probably feel the same way. But I would hope that if it was to happen to me, God forbid, I would let the process take place instead of just jumping ship or passing judgment before, you know, it should be rendered. When we spoke in May, Adarian told me that up until this incident, he wanted to be a cop. You wanted to be a cop? Yes. You still want to be a police officer? Oh, Why? Because I got shot. I do want to be a doctor now. When I talked to him, he said he wanted to be a police officer before this incident. Mm -hmm. He changed his mind after that day. Your thoughts, your words to him. I, I hate that. It, that's his mindset right now. Um, I can't say that I blame him, but nevertheless, even though he's such a young child, um, who knows what the future may hold, it may change his mind. Maybe once this all ends, totally ends, maybe he'll see law enforcement in a different light. Our thanks to DeMarco for that conversation. The World Health Organization says they're closely watching a new subvariant of the coronavirus this winter. Subvariant JN1 cases are now on the rise and are estimated to account for about 21% of new cases in the U.S. That's according to the CDC. They say there is no evidence that this variant of interest causes more severe illness than other variants, and they do expect the current vaccines to be effective. 
Four months after deadly wildfires tore through Maui, the heart of Lahaina has reopened. ABC's Will Carr shows us how the love of music is helping that community to heal. Music on Maui is more than just a melody. It's culture and history and community all wrapped into what's called melee. I almost don't want to use the word therapeutic, but that's probably a good word. Uh, it's a way to minister to other people, to assist them in bringing people together, to share in joys, to share in sadness. For four months, sadness has swept across Maui after fires devastated much of Lahaina, destroying thousands of homes and killing at least 100 people. Lost in the disaster, Lahaina Music, a store filled with instruments owned by Jason and Vanya Jerome. All my personal instruments were in the store when it burned, that was all gone. But we received some generous donations from some people that enabled the Koloha, for example, gave me this ukulele, which was awesome. <sighs> The aloha spirit of people being willing to give and help each other out has really been inspiring. Thanks to that aloha spirit, the Jeromes are still playing, joining other Hawaiian artists, including Jack Johnson, striving to keep music on Maui alive. Over the weekend, free guitars for kids delivering nearly 200 instruments to the island. We really want this to be a transformational gift and not just a transactional. We're not just giving somebody something, we're actually doing it through relationships. The organization teaming up with Johnson and touring artist and longtime Hawaii resident Ron Ortiz II. Handing out guitars and ukuleles to kids at the Ritz-Carlton Kapalua, many of whom lost their instruments when their homes burned. I lost a guitar, two ukuleles, um, a drum and piano. And so what does it mean to you to now have the guitar in your hands? I'm happy and I'm excited to play it, well, practice. Losing a guitar, it's like losing a baby, you know? And just having this opportunity to come up here and just, I mean, get a really nice guitar, it's just, it's amazing, yeah. We pass our instruments down in generations. So if you had an instrument, ukulele from your grandmother, a guitar from your grandfather, your great-grandfather, that's not replaceable. But we wanted to come and say, hey, we want to give you something that can help with your journey and help keep music, that fire of music, in your life. Don't be afraid, the pain can't hurt you anymore. Oh, oh, oh. I keep singing. Artista Second showing the kids the beauty of music and the healing strength yeah, of melee. I love music. It's my favorite thing to do. And I'm really happy to have this brand new guitar. What does melee mean to you? It's about coming together, sharing music and history and lineage and life through song. It's all encompassing, it's all collaborative and it's something that people can share together. And if you can't sing and you can't play an instrument, just you know, tapping on a, a table to, to keep the beat. And these people have poured knowledge into me very graciously and now it's my joy to be able to pass it on to others. It's kind of like a river, you're just a part in it. That river still flowing amidst a scarred landscape. Trying to bring the joy back however they can. Our thanks to Will Carr for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. For the next hour, the new evacuations from dangerous flooding after that deadly storm slammed the East Coast. Plus, the brewing legal battle over a controversial new immigration law in Texas, why civil rights groups claim it violates the Constitution. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts.
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. We begin with breaking news, a landmark decision involving former President Donald Trump. The Colorado Supreme Court has ruled Trump is ineligible to run for president in 2024 under the 14th Amendment. The court cited this chaotic scene outside the Capitol on January 6th, saying they believe Trump played a role in the insurrection. Colorado's Secretary of State is now ordered to exclude Trump's name from the state's Republican presidential primary ballot. The historic decision sets up a major battle before the nation's highest court. Leading us off tonight, ABC News political director Rick Klein and ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley. What exactly are the documents outlining as the rationale for not allowing former President Trump on the ballot? Well, the 14th Amendment, if you read it, makes pretty clear that if you engage in insurrection, you're ineligible to hold a, a public office. And in fact, the lower court in Colorado said that they, they found that President Trump did engage in an insurrection, but then they, they relied on kind of a, a, a narrow, almost technicality to say, we don't believe that, that this is an officer of the United States. The, the Colorado Supreme Court is actually overturning that and saying that the court was right in finding that the, the president engaged in an insurrection, tried to overturn the election, but was wrong in saying that that didn't disqualify him from office. And they are saying that, yes, this disqualifies him. But of course, it's a tenuous ruling. We know that other states and judges in other places have, have disagreed with it. And the, the Trump campaign is saying they will immediately go to the Supreme Court. Uh, in, in, we're even seeing the, the, this court say that they don't want to see this enacted until it has a chance to be appealed. They recognize the gravity of this decision. And, and the Trump campaign released a statement calling it a flawed decision and promising to appeal. Do you feel in some ways that this is just playing right into Trump's hands, that his claims that the, the election is rigged against him? Yeah, honestly, Lindsay, I think this is something that the Trump campaign 
uh, feels good about because they can lean in on it. He, look, his opponents, none of his major opponents, even Chris Christie, think that the 14th Amendment should apply here. They're saying that the voters should have the opportunity to weigh in. And this does dovetail almost almost too, too well for comfort for those rivals with the, the claim that President Trump continues to make that not just that the election was stolen, that false claim, but also that there's an effort to try to deny him and his movement uh, another chance to regain the presidency. I can't imagine that the, 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 the former president is going to lean in on it and his remarks in Iowa this evening and continue to campaign on moves like this by Democratic uh, 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 judges that, uh, that, that, in his view, disenfranchises his own voters. And, and politically, what does this do when we're talking about other states who have similar attempts uh, trying to keep Trump off of their ballots? Well, we know that in, in six other states, we've seen judges reject these arguments. So it is, of course, uh, a, a very split decision, to say the least, to have now one court in Colorado, the Supreme Court in Colorado, have this opinion. Uh, it is going to almost certainly have to go to the United States Supreme Court to, to, to sort out. Uh, it might give cover to other, other efforts to, to, try to, to try to deny ballot access. But I think now there's going to be a realization that only the Supreme Court is going to be able to sort this out. We have national elections in this country. We also have elections, though, that are administered by the state, which is what gives the Colorado Supreme Court uh, the ability uh, and, in fact, the, the necessity to rule on a challenge like this. And, and President Biden did win Colorado in 2020 with 55 percent of the vote. So how big could the impact be if this really is allowed to stand? Is this state really seen to be as in play for Republicans in 2024? I, yeah, I think the least of the concerns are Colorado and its 10 electoral votes, not just because Colorado isn't really a frontline battleground like it used to be just a few election cycles ago. It has drifted to the left, but also because it is likely that there's going to be a national standard set on this. And if the U.S. Supreme Court rules on it, it's going to make that clear everywhere. In the meantime, though, we'll have a bit of a hodgepodge in a waiting, in a waiting period. All right, Rick, thank you so much. And for more on this, I want to bring in ABC News legal contributor and professor of law at University of Baltimore, Kim Whaley. Kim, thanks so much for joining us. What's next for the former president here? The Colorado Supreme Court ruling against him. They're promising to appeal. Now what? Well, it would go to the Supreme Court of the United States, which now al already is considering Donald Trump's claim of complete, absolute presidential immunity for January 6th. And there's also a related case um, that could affect two of the counts uh, pending against him in D.C. relating to the January 6th insurrection. Also, the Supreme Court just took that. So that's that's a lot on the plate of the Supreme Court. And there's, of course, a lot of pressure um, across the board because the caucuses are coming up, The you know, uh, Super Tuesday, and of course the election is less than a year away in November of next year. And your, to your point there, if this does go all the way up to the Supreme Court, could the justices take this case up that quickly and decide before the Iowa caucus and New Hampshire primaries, which are about to get underway? Well, we saw the court do this in, you know, 2020 with the election uh, and all the cases relating to the, the false claims of election fraud, but also um, ballot counting, mail-in ballots, things like that. The court can do things rapidly if it decides. Uh, and so I think there's there's also going to be all eyes on the court and how, uh, with these are split decisions, if they're thinking about this politically, there are doctrines that they can employ to step out of it and just not get involved, or they can get involved. But the thing to keep in mind is, even if the court sets a standard on what the definition is of an insurrection and whether the president is an officer, that wouldn't necessarily affect all of the states because um, each state has different laws for how you get on the ballot. And so even a Supreme Court ruling isn't necessarily going to impact everyone because you need a, a, you know, a hook to get into court to begin with that doesn't have a lot to do with, uh, with the 14th Amendment. Here it has to do with who gets to be on the ballot under Colorado law. And what happens if the Supreme Court declines to take the case? Well, then the Colorado Supreme Court's decision, the one that came down day, today, that stands. And Donald Trump is not on the ballot in the state of Colorado uh, for the 2024 presidential election. And what do you think about the state's decision? We were just talking to Rick. Obviously, other states have considered this, but then weighed in, in the other direction. Uh, your thoughts uh, on what, how Colorado is ruling here? Well, honestly, I mean, I, I see the political argument, but, this, uh, but the Constitution is the Constitution, and the reason it's in there, it's a post-Civil War amendment to keep Confederates out of the reconstructed government. So the Constitution's the top dog in the, con in the country. You can't be 25 and one for president. So, I mean, that, that sort of, that supersedes voters, really. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the Supreme Court makes the argument, the Colorado Supreme Court, uh, that the president is treated as an officer 25 other times in the 
Constitution. So I don't think it's an invalid ruling. Is there any precedent for a case like this that we can look to for guidance? Not from the Supreme Court, no. I mean, there are just a handful right after the Civil War, but it's really sort of gone by the wayside because we've never been in a position uh, where someone running for president engaged in an insurrection. Uh, and both courts now have found that, the lower court and the, and the Supreme Court. If you were a betting woman, do you think the Supreme Court takes up this case? And let's go even further. How do they rule? Well, I think... You know, given that it's percolating in multiple states, the Supreme Court might wait to see what's happening in other places. Um, you know, I think if, if they do take it up, it would be a split decision. I think there's no way it would be um, sort of a unanimous ruling. I'm sure the conservatives would find a technical reading of this idea of officers. But the Colorado Supreme Court applied dictionary definitions from, you know, 1787. Uh, so it's kind of a conservative approach. Um, but it's so political, Lindsay. It's, it's just kind of a stunning from a constitutional law perspective that we're in this moment in American history right now. It really is fascinating indeed. Kim Whaley, we thank you so much for your insight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Now to the devastating aftermath from that powerful storm that ransacked the Northeast. Dangerous flooding prompted emergencies in New Hampshire. The Pemi River expected to rise and overflow overnight. Evacuation orders were also issued in Lewiston, Maine today. Two people in that state are now missing after their car was swept away in rushing water. And in Lincoln Park, New Jersey, a home on fire surrounded by floodwaters. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt. Tonight, rivers raging and rising out of their banks across the Northeast, flooding new neighborhoods after a powerful storm slammed the region. First responders going door to door in Little Falls late today, evacuating trapped families, using boats to take residents to higher ground in Wayne. In Lincoln Park, a home surrounded by four feet of flood water engulfed in flames. This fire has been burning basically unchecked now for at least 45 minutes. Firefighters in high water vehicles barely able to get close enough to reach the fire and not far away in Patterson, first responders seen carrying a person from a flooded home on a stretcher. Uh, this was apparently a dialysis patient that needed some medical attention. The house was surrounded by floodwaters. South of Boston in Situate, Massachusetts, a race to restore power. Right now getting the schools back on is our top priority as well as our water treatment plant is still on generator power. Residents filling gas cans for their generators. Cafe owner Mary Ellen Stoddard throwing away spoiled food. This is a tough week for this to happen. It's tough anytime it happens, but Christmas week is, is brutal. And it's not over. Authorities in Lewiston, Maine, ordering evacuations there late today. In the town of Mexico, authorities still searching for two people after their car was swept away Monday. Maine's governor declaring a state of emergency for 14 counties. The death toll from the storms rising to at least five across multiple states. Deadly and destructive. Trevor all joins us now. Trevor, you're in New Jersey where there's still a flood threat tonight. Uh, there sure is, Lindsay, and for context, behind me are the Great Falls with the Passaic River rushing over it. Now, typically, you'd be able to see a number of rocks, large stones, boulders at the bottom. You can't see them right now because they're all underwater, and this river is not expected to crest until late tonight. This whole area is going to be under major flood stage through tomorrow. Lindsay. All right, Trevor Alt for us, thank you. And with major rivers still rising in the northeast, a powerful storm is targeting the west with heavy rain, wind, and massive disruptions as holiday travel ramps up. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us tonight. Hey, Rob. Now, hi, Lindsay. You're right about that. The, the Passaic's not the only river here in the Northeast that's still in flood stage. We've got dozens of them that are overflowing their banks at this hour. And most of these in, in red highlighted, they're going to be cresting here in the next day or two and then receding uh, slowly. We're looking for a couple days of dry weather at least. Meanwhile, flood watches are up in the west because of this big storm hitting northern California now. And it's going to slide into uh, uh, southern Cal central and southern California the next couple days. Could see wind gusts to 60 miles an hour. It's going to take its time. So some of these numbers are going to really begin to pile up. Thursday Day, by the way, the busiest air travel day of the year. So Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, you could have some issues with air travel delays. Three to five inches of rainfall expected from Orange County up through uh, Santa Barbara, San Lu uh, Luis Obispo. Four to eight maybe in the Santa, uh, Santa Monica Mountains and up towards Ventura. And because of that, in those hilly areas, there's a high potential of seeing uh, uh, rock and mudslide activity right through uh, Friday uh, Friday morning. So that could be a big high impact storm for the West Coast. We just got done with ours here on the East Coast. Luckily uh, for the folks in the Northeast and the flood zone, we are looking for dry weather into the weekend. 
Lindsay? Oh, that is some good news there. Rob Marciano for us. Thanks so much, Rob. Now to the border battle in Texas. Tonight, the ACLU has filed a lawsuit challenging the state's new law, which gives police sweeping new powers to arrest migrants who cross the border illegally. Here's ABC's Maria Villarreal with the latest. Tonight, with a record high number of migrants funneling through the southern border, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signing a new law allowing migrants suspected of crossing the illegally to be arrested and ordered Texas. deported by the state. Biden's deliberate inaction has left Texas to fend for itself. Under the law, once in custody, migrants could be deported or prosecuted, facing up to six months in jail or 20 years in prison for repeat offenses. The goal of Senate Bill 4 is to stop the tidal wave of illegal entry into Texas. The Texas law immediately challenged as unconstitutional by the ACLU, saying it encourages racial profiling, can lead to family separations, and can deny migrants the chance to request asylum. This is an extreme law that will not and does not uh, make the communities in Texas safer. It just doesn't. There is an undeniable crisis at the border. Sources telling ABC News Customs and Border Protection encountered more than 12,600 migrants Monday, a daily record high, apprehending 11,000 outside legal ports of entry, the highest daily total in more than two decades. The strain on U.S. resources unprecedented. CBP closing rail crossings in El Paso and Eagle Pass, shifting personnel to counter the surge. We're we're facing severe challenges right now. Our thanks to Maria for that. Now to the stunning images out of Iceland's southwestern coast where a volcano is still erupting from three vents spewing lava up to 100 feet in the air. That's actually less volcanic activity than we've seen from the volcano in recent days. At least 320 earthquakes have hit the area since it blew on Monday. And officials say the eruptions threaten a geothermal power plant at nearby fishing village. Our Marcus Moore reports tonight from Iceland. Tonight, the growing concern over toxic gas moving over Iceland's capital city as new dramatic images show the fast-moving lava spewing from the ground, lighting up the night sky. Explosions of magma hurling the molten rock into the air. The country's meteorological office measuring more than 300 earthquakes since the eruption late Monday night. We were led through the charred and rocky terrain. In the distance, you see more fresh lava spewing out of the ground. The crack in the ground there stretches for about two and a half miles. For the moment, we're grounded. Andy Jones, returning from a 50th birthday trip, captured this video at the Reykjavik airport. We're waiting on the runway. Officials say while the fissure had grown rapidly, the eruption is stabilizing and doesn't present a threat to life. The most thing ever is that you don't know what's going on, what, what will happen tomorrow. The lava now flowing away from a nearby geothermal power plant and a small fishing town of Grindavik evacuated last month following large cracks that split roads in two. Our thanks to Marcus for that. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime coming up. Tis the season for holiday shopping, but all that gift giving may actually be putting you in financial trouble. It will help you unpack the psychology behind spiraling credit card debt. But next, the scene in North Korea that's raising questions about Kim Jong-un and his succession plans. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Hit me with them good vibes. Pictures on my phone live. Everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Dance a more just a little bit. Breathe a more just a little bit. Smile a little more and I'm in a way. Ah, 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 ah.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. At least 100 elephants have died in Zimbabwe's largest national park in recent weeks because of a drought. Their carcasses, a grisly sign of what wildlife authorities say is the impact of climate change and the El Nino weather phenomenon. The International Fund for Animal Welfare has described it as a crisis not only for elephants, but other animals. Christmas in Cuba is not looking so merry amid the country's economic woes. The island's economy, saddled by U.S. sanctions and a tourism shortfall, is nearly collapsing with fuel, food, and medicine shortages. The crisis has spurred record-breaking migration, according to U.S. government numbers, that show nearly half of a million people have arrived at the U.S. border alone in the past two years. And in North Korea, Kim Jong-un's daughter tagged along to watch a missile launch, again raising questions about succession plans. The country's state newspaper published pictures of the leader's 10-year-old daughter right at his side, again overseeing a missile test site on Monday. The girl was also seen shaking hands with experienced military officials, which leaves many watchers asking if she is the next in line. Back in this country, the holiday season is a time of gift-giving and lots of merriment, but also a time when a lot of us get into some serious credit card trouble. In fact, about one-third of Americans will go into debt for their holiday shopping, and a quarter of Americans are actually still paying off holiday debt from last year. Altogether, Americans are saddled with more than $1 trillion in credit card debt. To unpack the psychology behind this spiraling debt, we are joined now by CNET senior editor Nick Walney. Nick, Thanks so much for joining us tonight. First, how did we get here? Why are so many Americans so deep into credit card debt? People are leaning into credit cards much more than they were previously. There are a couple of different factors here. One big factor is obviously inflation. Things are just more expensive than they used to be. <laughs> Cost of goods is up across the board. And so we're seeing a lot of Americans lean more into credit cards in order to make ends meet. So this isn't just frivolous shopping, Lindsay. It's not people uh, being flippant or uh, doing a lot of new travel. It's a lot of times people just trying to make ends meet with the budget when it comes to groceries and other basics. And so as a result of that, but combined with raising APRs that are really compounding a lot of that interest, we see Americans carrying much more credit card debt than they were previously. And let's talk about the impact of e-commerce and digital wallets. How do these one-click purchases actually trick our brains, essentially? Buy now, pay later is very popular when you go to check out, when you're checking out uh, from an Instagram ad or something like that, and you see the option to either pay $50 or to pay for payments of $12.50. Boy, that $12.50 just feels much better in the moment. And it's that delayed payment, you know, it actually creates a little bit more of a dopamine release in our brain when we end up having that option. We go with the option that's less painful. We go with the option that's going to feel better. And so it's important for people to be aware of that, how that can be treacherous, because because even though buy now, pay later doesn't necessarily have interest rates, there are late fees, and it just reinforces this loop, Lindsay, of not paying for the thing that you're buying in the moment <laughs> and punting that payment until later, that tends to get a lot of people in trouble. And so what you're saying is the mere anticipation of using a credit card actually activates the reward network in our brain. How does that mean that, that potentially we're wired, I guess, for retail therapy? Yeah, exactly. It's a lot of what happens. And a lot of times people think that the uh, the psychology is very much that the pain of payment is reduced when you're using a credit card. Uh, but some recent behavioral studies have shown that even just the act of using the credit card, even the, uh, the experience of seeing the credit card logo on the checkout page actually causes a dopamine hit. We oh. associate seeing that credit card logo with, uh, you know, okay, something good is down the pipe, something 
and goods coming soon as a result of seeing that. And so it's something that is really powerful. It's really reinforced in American culture. And it's something to be aware of, especially as for many Americans, this is the most expensive time of year. It's when you tend to put more things on your credit card. It's when you tend to go over budget. And the last thing you want to do is to wake up in January and be like, oh, gosh, what have I done? And look at your bank statement right. and wonder how you got here. Your credit score um, is also impacted by having all of that credit. But, but let's talk about the credit card companies for a moment. The Federal Reserve found that 80 percent of their profits actually come from the interest that's charged to borrowers. What should Americans understand about how these companies work that, that could actually help them get out of debt? Yeah, $105 billion was paid in interest last year alone from American borrowers. And I think that one thing that is really helpful for people to be aware of now is that credit card APRs have gone up a lot recently. We know that inflation is happening. We know that the Federal Reserve has been raising rates to try to cool off the economy and cool off inflation. When that happens, credit card lenders will adjust by increasing your APR. And so back in 2021, we had an average APR of about 14 points. 6% on a credit card. Earlier this year, that same stat was above 21%. And for some retail credit cards, we're pushing interest rates above 30%. Uh, so it might be helpful for consumers to take a moment, take a look at what the interest rate is on your credit card. From the people I interviewed, no one knew what their APR was. <laughs> and so you might take a moment to really look at that and transfer it if that's what makes the most sense for you. And just lastly, <clears throat> I guess just with some common sense advice, would you say also just think about what you're buying? Can you actually afford it now? Yeah, I think it's great advice. You know, as Jay Z says, if you can't afford to pay it up front in cash twice, then you can't afford it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm inclined to agree, especially with credit card APRs where they are right now. Cash is king. Rely on cash. Make sure you've got enough money along the way. Good advice there. All right. Nick Walney, really appreciate your reporting on this. Thanks so much. And still to come, sign of the times. We'll introduce you to the Santa Clauses using much more than their hands for creating toys in their workshops. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, the St. Nick's making sure they can communicate with all children this holiday season. Meeting Santa Claus for many children is a time-honored tradition a magical moment to sit on his lap, whisper in his ear their wish list for Christmas. Do you like that tree over there? And now, across the country, thanks to a growing number of Santas who use American Sign Language, deaf and hearing impaired children are able to delight in the same memorable experience as their peers. This signing Santa in Denver, who's also deaf, knows just how these children feel, sharing this story from his own childhood. And one time, we went to visit with Santa Claus. And I saw my three sisters, brother, all laughing, having a great time chatting with Santa. And then it came my turn. He, Santa's smile dropped. His face turned blank. And I didn't understand. He, he was just handing me a piece of paper. And I felt off. Why was I different? Seeing their children connecting with Santa means a lot to these mothers, too. 
This mother telling us no interpreter, just chatting with the kids and making that connection. And for the deaf children, having that direct access to communication with a deaf Santa Claus who uses the same language that the children do is phenomenal. It's a joy-filled experience for Santa, too. The glisten in their eyes, you know, we're making their day. And they're finally, you know, being able to tell deaf Santa Claus what they want. And for me, it's such a blessing. The magic of inclusivity. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis, ABC News Live. is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.